afternoon, everyone. It's my uh, honor to be joined by a highly distinguished group of patriotic Americans who have served this country in uniform, served this country in combat, and now are serving this country in the United States Congress. They understand through their own life experiences of service how urgent it is that the House pass forth with the bipartisan and comprehensive national security bill that has been advanced in the United States Senate. This is a, mer a matter of America's urgent national security. It's a matter of democracy. It's a matter of freedom. It's a matter of standing by our allies. And in the absence of doing so, particularly as it relates to the ongoing war of aggression launched by Russia against Ukraine, it's a matter of American lives potentially being on the line if Ukraine and its brave war effort falters because of inaction here in the United States Congress by extreme MAGA Republicans. It's my honor to yield uh, to a highly distinguished member of Congress, an Army Ranger, someone who has served multiple tours of duty and fought valiantly for this country in both Iraq and Afghanistan, Congressman Jason Crow. Thank you, Leader Jeffries, uh, and thank you to my colleagues. It's always a great honor to stand here with my fellow veterans in service uh, that have served in the intelligence community and the military. Uh, Representative Spanberger and I just returned from Ukraine on a bipartisan congressional delegation where we had the chance to meet with U.S. officials, Ukrainian military and intelligence officials, and of course President Zelensky. And what we can tell you is that the Ukrainians are prepared to fight and win the battle for not only their own survival, but the battle for democracy and freedom worldwide, because that is what is at stake here. But I also want to be very clear that this effort to pass a national security bill is not charity. This bill and this effort is directly, directly aligned in support of U.S. national security interests in the American people. The purpose of this bill and effort is to stop Russian aggression in Europe, stop it where it is. The purpose of this bill is to protect the 100,000 plus U.S. servicemen and women and their families stationed throughout Europe. The purpose of this bill is to protect our largest economic trading partner in Europe. The purpose of this bill is to protect our food supply and our food prices coming from the breadbasket of Ukraine. And how do we do that? We do that by spending over half of this money directly in U.S. businesses where U.S. workers, men and women, will assemble the supplies and the equipment necessary for Ukraine to fight and win. And then that new stuff that those workers make, that goes directly to our U.S. military to modernize our own equipment and supplies, and then our military sends our old stuff to Ukraine. So we are protecting our economy, we're protecting our troops and our families, we're protecting our food supplies, we are updating our military uh, readiness and supplies, and we are defending democracy. And if we don't do that, we will live in a drastically different world than we live in now. One where the strong and the larger can just take by force the smaller. And that is not a world we want our children and grandchildren to live in. There are moments in history that will dictate the course for generations to come. And we are at one of those moments right now. House Democrats will not turn our backs on our troops, 
We will not turn our backs on our economy and our businesses. We will not turn our backs on our allies. We will not turn our backs on the American people. We will, as always, lead. And with that, I'm very honored to turn it over to my dear friend and colleague, Mikey Sherrill from New Jersey. Thank you. As a former Navy helicopter pilot and a former Russian policy officer in the United States Navy, I can tell you that for those of us up here who joined Congress to continue our service to our country, who joined Congress to make sure we were serving our states and our nation, last week was a really hard week. After months of what we thought was maybe an impossible negotiation, we came together in the Senate in a bipartisan way on a border deal to make sure we had critical investments in our border that our nation needs. And when the former President Trump saw that coming together, he evidently decided that it was better for his campaign not to fix the problem at the border, but to run his partisan campaign on fomenting a greater crisis at the border. We saw, as our Senate came together, to try to pass the supplemental supporting all of our allies. The Speaker of the House put forth a supplemental designed to actually kill the one that could pass in a really cynical move. So now, as we see the Senate, again, doing the impossible, coming together in a bipartisan way in these partisan times, and passing a supplemental, that will support our allies across the world, that will support the United States in our ability to compete economically, to compete on our values, to make sure global democracy thrives, we again see the former president dictating to our speaker that instead of solving problems, instead of standing for democracy, the extremists in the House are going to take that bill down. It's really incomprehensible. It's really hard to see as we're fighting tooth and nail to make sure our allies thrive that that partnership between China, Iran, and Russia that is developing, that we stand strong against it with the democratic nations, it's hard to see the former president suggest that he would ally the, ally the United States with that triumvirate. So, as we move forward, I think this is a turning point, as Jason said. This is critical for our nation's future. We have got to pass this supplemental. We have got to come together and find a pathway to do that. I think the future of our nation, our economy, our values are all at stake. So without further ado, I will now turn it over to Representative Carbajal, someone who is um, the senior member president, present, as he liked <laughs> to tell us. Um, he would be cutting the cake, he said, at the Marine Corps birthday. But I will turn it over to him to talk about how important the supplemental is. Thank you, Representative Cheryl. That reference was because of my age. <laughs> Nothing more. House Republicans know this bill would pass, but they are still taking orders from the pro-Putin wing of their party and Donald Trump, who recently has made his feelings known about supporting our allies very clear. But as a Marine veteran and someone who has mobilized in the 90s, when we were confronting a different dictator invading his neighbor, let me be clear about what happens if the Speaker fails to bring this bill up for a vote. This supplemental won't just save lives today by delivering aid and helping defend civilian lives. This package will save lives in the future, as was said earlier. The men and women of our armed forces who could be called upon to respond to a wider conflict and new wars. If Russia, in Donald Trump's words, does whatever it wants to Ukraine, we know that it may not stop there. If we do not approve this bill today, we still have to approve it eventually. Only next time, it might be to defend a NATO ally, it would, and it would just not be American dollars. It could be the lives of American service members, and yes, civilians. 
With that, let me turn it over to my good friend and colleague, Representative Chrissy Houlihan, who has distinguished military service. Thank you, everyone. And I first want to thank uh, Leader Jeffries for his tireless advocacy and for all of my fellow veterans and national security colleagues as well. I serve on the Armed Services and Intelligence Committee, but before my service began, there's been a really strong heritage of service in my family. My father, my grandfather served in Korea. As a military child, my mother lived 26 miles away from Hiroshima when she was a teenager. My father was born in the throes of World War II in Lviv, which is, which is now Ukraine, and survived the Holocaust. But as an adult, he served our country in Vietnam. I served the United States in the United States Air Force during Desert Storm. I'm sharing all of this with you because you could probably say and hear that this is personal to me. I intimately see the connection between Ukraine and Israel, Asia and this, our great nation. But this is not just personal to me. It is and should be personal to all of us. And in fact, it's not just personal. I believe it to be existential for all of us. If the U.S. does not continue to lead and lead now in protecting democracies, I genuinely fear, and clearly many of my colleagues do as well, that generations of my family, families with stories just like mine and yours, will pay the consequences. And this infuriates me. I cannot say it more clearly than this. The Republican-led House is derelict in their duties to our allies and to us, our nation. We need to vote and vote now to aid Ukraine, Israel, Taiwan, and for humanitarian purposes. For our allies, for ourselves, and for our future, Speaker Johnson needs to find the courage to bring this to a vote. Thank you very much for my time. Uh, I have the distinguished honor to present my friend and colleague, Representative Spanberger. Thank you so much for being here. I just returned from a CODEL with Congressman Crow to Ukraine, where we sat down with Ukrainian leaders, military leaders, intelligence leaders, and the president, and spoke of the extraordinary work that they are doing on the battlefield to protect their nation, to protect democratic values, and to seek freedom. As Chrissy mentioned, this moment is existential. It is not an exaggeration to say that this vote is absolutely one of the most important votes that we will cast in the House of Representatives. Because when we look at the reality on the ground in a world where Vladimir Putin invaded Ukraine and the Ukrainians are doing the fighting to free their own country and fight for democratic values, all they need is a bit of help. When we look at the fact that Vladimir Putin is indeed meeting with Hamas leadership, when we look at the fact that Iranian drones are flying into Ukraine and attacking or attempting to attack Israeli civilians, what stands in the way of that? U.S. aid, funding for the Iron Dome, support to our allies in the Middle East. And when so many of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle speak consistently of their worries about China and confronting China, and here we have a chance to ensure that Taiwan is able to defend itself if China were ever to aggress against Taiwan, they're not taking up the bill for a vote. This is a moment where when we look at which way is the world going to orient, is it going to orient towards freedom? Is it going to orient towards the United States? Is it going to orient towards democracy? Or are we, the United States of America, like the most extraordinary nation on earth, going to walk away from what is our responsibility, to walk away from what is our own national security priorities and interests, and allow the defeat of Ukraine allow the abandonment of our allies and allow for our foes to rise up allied with one another uh, in, in destruction of and certainly against the democratic principles that every single member of the House of Representatives should be voting to support. Um, and with that, I thank you for being here and I turn it back to Leader Jeffries. Thank you so much, uh, Abigail, who of course served this country uh, in such a distinguished way in the CIA, and of course, thank you to all of uh, the members who are here, Jason, uh, Mikey, uh, Salud, Chrissy, uh, who served in the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, and Marines. And I also want to acknowledge the presence of two 
additional distinguished veterans, uh, Jake Auchincloss and Seth Moulton, both of whom are Marines, put their lives on the line, and served in combat overseas. Questions? Um, when you discuss uh, using every legislative tool possible, I know there's been a lot of talk about a potential discharge petition to get this to the House floor. Uh, but is there any concern that you might lose more Democrats on one side of this to try to get a discharge petition than Republicans would be willing to come over and sign on to it? No. All options are on the table. We're going to utilize every available legislative tool. And what is clear is that there are more than 300 bipartisan votes in the House of Representatives to pass the national security bill today. More than 300 bipartisan votes. It's not too much to ask in America's national security that we get an up or down vote and let the House of Representatives actually work its will as opposed to allowing Donald Trump to work his will and block our national security priorities. Leader Jeffrey. Just, just to follow up, so how many Democrats do you think you would lose on this, first of all? And secondly, have you actually begun that process of reaching out to Republicans to sign on to a discharge petition? We're going to have a conversation uh, in our leadership meeting today. We'll also meet uh, as a steering and policy committee and then as a caucus family uh, tomorrow morning to discuss the precise steps that we will take. Uh, but it's clear to me that the overwhelming majority of House Democrats are ready, willing, and able to support the national security bill right now. We're not the problem. The problem is on the extreme MAGA Republican side. Let's be clear. They need to end the partisanship, the brinksmanship, and the gamesmanship and work with us in a bipartisan way to get this done. Let me also yield... Uh, just to Seth and Jake uh, for any comments that they may have. Okay. Thanks very much, Leader Jeffries. Look, Republicans, <clears throat> excuse me, Republicans are playing politics with this. That's the bottom line. And what they are doing is politicizing aid to Israel. They're supporting Putin over the freedom fighters in Ukraine. They're doing nothing about the border because it's good for their politics. And they're sending a message to Vladimir Putin and Xi Jinping that they can get away with whatever they want because America won't stand up for our values or our allies. It's Democrats who are trying to bring people together. It's Democrats who are standing up for fundamental American values. It's Democrats who are fighting here in Washington today to keep Americans safe and secure. So they're playing politics. We're trying to bring people together and get this done. That's the bottom line. And we know that we have to do it. Thank you, Mr. Jeffries, for bringing us together. Uh, I was a Marine officer, served in Afghanistan and Panama. I saw the futility of a nation-building exercise in Afghanistan. I saw the high impact that partnering with an ally in Panama could have and the return on investment that that type of mission has. And that's what I'm seeing in Ukraine. For Less than Americans spend on soft drinks every year. We have cratered more than half of Russia's conventional military capacity. We've doubled its border with NATO. We have sent a message to our allies in Europe and the Indo-Pacific that the United States stands with freedom and democracy the world over. We have made Beijing and the Kremlin uh, think twice about the cost of aggression. This has been the highest return on national security dollars in my lifetime. And Speaker Johnson's craven submission to Donald Trump is appeasement. It's not just appeasement to Donald Trump, it's appeasement to the axis of evil between the Ayatollah in Iran and the Kremlin and the Chinese Communist Party. This, this fusion of totalitarianism and terror and tyranny uh, that seeks to upend the Pax Americana from, from World War II uh, onwards. And as Leader Jeffries said, the American people deserve an up or down vote in the House of Representatives to see where their representative stands on this momentous issue. Thank you. Thank you, Seth. Thank you, Jake. Mr. Leader, and also for members, um, have you started discussions with Republicans about potential alternate bill? I know some Republicans, including 
um, Chairman Rogers just told me, and others who are kind of swing votes have said they might be voting, be offering different border and Ukraine bills. Are any of you having conversations with Republicans about what that could look like? There's certainly ongoing conversations that are taking place member to member, uh, but then we yield to Jason and, and Abigail, who were just in Ukraine, uh, and others if they want to step in. Yeah, I would just reiterate what the speaker said, that there, there are a lot of Republican votes for this effort. Uh, a lot of folks that I'm talking to all the time that just want the opportunity for a vote because they know and they see the things that we've been talking about here. This is good for our economy, it's good for our national security, it's good for our alliances, and it's necessary to push back on totalitarianism and dictatorship around the world. And they don't want to raise children uh, in a world where Russia takes Ukraine and sweeps through uh, Europe either. Uh, so we just want the opportunity for the vote. Uh, and as some of my colleagues have also pointed out, this is just a good investment for the American people. You know, this bill constitutes, and our aid overall constitutes less than 5% of our defense budget, our annual defense budget. So for 5% of our annual defense budget, we're protecting our economy, we're protecting 100,000 troops, we're, we're protecting our allies, we're ensuring a prosperous and stable Europe, uh, and we're also uh, supporting American workers and businesses while we're doing it. Just to speak to the second part, um, because I have had conversations with colleagues, the, the reality is that the United States Senate, a bipartisan group, worked four months to come up with a compromise that then, at the behest of the former president, the speaker made clear that he was going to tank and bring down. And so while I appreciate, uh, and I, I speak only for myself on this, while I appreciate that some of my colleagues now want to have conversations about what has been a broken system for years upon years, uh, it's, it's too late to start fresh. The reality is that our Ukrainian allies on the battlefield need us to pass the supplemental. Again, we need to pass it for our own national security interests. Um, but if we are going to see the defeat of Vladimir Putin by the Ukrainian army, that support cannot wait another four or five months to then again potentially see, you know, via social media pronouncements, the former president proclaim that he wants the House to take down such an effort. The United States Senate passed this bill with 70 votes. We have to bring this bill up. We have to do it immediately. And as Leader Jeffrey said, if we took this vote today, the vast majority of members of Congress would vote for it. Yes, uh, I just wanted to ask, along the same lines of what Ms. Spanberger just said, would you be open to border policy changes at this point, or is that off the table after the collapse of that Senate deal? I think as uh, Abigail and others have repeatedly indicated, we recognize that we have a broken immigration system that needs to be fixed in a comprehensive and enlightened manner consistent with the rule of law and our values. And we have clear challenges at the border that need to be addressed. We support a strong, secure, and humane border. But our Republican colleagues are not serious about doing anything about the challenges at the border because they've been ordered by Donald Trump to walk away from solving the problem in a common sense fashion. That has been made clear. They're not even hiding it. We have a national security bill in front of us that passed the Senate in decisive and bipartisan fashion. And all we need is an up or down vote so we can lift up America's national security priorities. Period. Full stop. Second round. Thanks, Leader Jeffries. Today, President Biden, as you know, came out and gave an impassioned speech and, and a plea to Speaker Johnson to put this bill up for a vote. Uh, he also criticized former President Trump. Whether those criticisms, they may very well be warranted, but if you are working to try to get Republicans to, to be on board with you for a discharge petition or for you know, some other mechanism, 
Does that, do you think that may hurt your effort, you know, the speeches like that where, where there is criticism of the other side as you're trying to, you know, figure out how to pass this? Well, the former president has injected himself into the conversation. He blew up the bipartisan national security bill that included changes in border policy that the Republicans had previously asked for for months and themselves negotiated. The former president did inject himself into the conversation. So I haven't had an opportunity to review President Biden's comments, uh, but I certainly stand behind the urgency that President Biden has articulated with respect to taking up this legislation. So, um, just with respect to what Johnson said kind of a few times now, that there has to be some sort of end game in mind for the conflict in Ukraine. I just want to ask you personally, what, what is your definition of an end? I mean, is this when they take back the Donbass? Is that when maybe they go past that to Crimea? And then secondly, um, maybe to someone who went on the CODEL, uh, did Tucker's interview with Putin come up? And if so, what kind of reactions were there from uh, some of the leadership there in Ukraine? I think the members have made clear, but I'm going to yield to them, uh, that significant progress has already been made by the Ukrainians fighting bravely to defend their homeland along with democracy, freedom, and American values that are on the line in connection uh, with our traditional alliance with NATO. But let me yield to Mikey, did you want to talk about Abigail? Well, just on the... On the, on the trip? Uh, in I defer to the CIA always. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, just to quantify, right, the Ukrainians have fought and won back more than 50% of the territory that the Russians have taken uh, since the 2022 invasion. Because of the Ukrainians fighting against the Russians, uh, more than 20 million metric tons of grain were able to get out of Ukraine and into the world food market, right? The absence of that would have been catastrophic. So when we're talking about the, the, what success looks like, the Ukrainians have been sustaining success, but they need the resources and the ability to continue further. As for uh, the Tucker Carlson interview, uh, and I'll, I'll fact check myself on this with, uh, with Representative Pro. Uh, we, of course, spoke about it on, on the CODEL quite a bit, uh, but it actually did not come up with any of my conversations with Ukrainian interlocutors. Um, and I would argue that it's because the ridiculous nature of an American so-called journalist uh, allowing for Putin to unleash propaganda uh, for an extended <coughs> period of time just wasn't worthy of the types of conversations that we were having, ones that were actually serious conversations about U.S. national security interests uh, and the challenges facing our allies. I don't know if you had any others. Yeah, the Ukrainians are too busy fighting a war to really give a damn what a Putin, Putin pro propagandist is saying in, in Moscow. So they, they're not paying attention to Tucker Carlson for sure. Uh, but. Uh, on the, the point of what does the end game look like, I think this is a really important point. Um, I, I understand, you know, having served like many of my colleagues in Afghanistan during multiple deployments, I cannot understand the reluctance uh, by America of getting involved uh, in a protracted conflict or engagement. But uh, this is not that. And I can say that very clearly, right? American troops are not doing the fighting and dying. Uh, and we are not going to need to continue to pass supplemental after supplemental, because one thing that was really clear from our visit is the remarkable, the remarkable efforts in Ukraine to stand up its own industrial base and to move towards economic self-sufficiency. They, they are moving fast to build their own industrial base, to, to build their own weapons. They simply need a bridge to self-sufficiency. And that's what this supplemental bill will, will do, is it will buy them the critical time that they need in 2024, the bridge to self-sufficiency, to stand on their own. And if we're able to help them do that, they will stand on their own, they will be strong, they will be independent, they will be fierce, and they will be friends of the United States. And that is something that we all should want.
I just want to sort of foot stomp on what Abigail and Jason said and your question about what does success look like. We have seen the Ukrainians keep the port of Odessa open. You remember the agreement they had with Russia, which Russia walked back, but the port is open, shipping out grain supplies to largely the African continent, which is critical for the world food supply. We have seen Ukraine hold Kiev, which Russia thought it was going to roll over in a matter of days. They have kept Kiev free to, to date. And we've seen them keep the eastern manufacturing sector, which, as Jason was pointing out, will allow them to be independent. It produced about 90 percent of Soviet-era munitions, so that's a really critical piece of the country. Success largely looks like um, where, where the Ukrainians are today. As, as you probably heard, we thought that Russia was the second best military in the world, only to find they were the second best military in Ukraine. So it's really, I think, where we are today um, has, has been a great success story for the Ukrainian military. But when I hear from people, well, why? You know, why doesn't Russia then kind of sue for people? Why don't we come to the table with Russia? There is no reason right now for Putin, as we are standing here, not having passed a supplemental, there is no reason for Putin to think, why end it now, right? Why not wait it out, see if his friend, the former President Trump, gets into office so they can form their alliance against NATO, I guess. I mean, this is the time that we pass the supplemental. This is the time that we support Ukrainian success. This is the time that we stand for what America has always stood for, um, democracy and supporting our allies. And if I could also add kind of what success doesn't look like. What success doesn't look like is I had the opportunity to, to travel to Lithuania a few weeks ago, had the chance to meet with their assistant minister of defense, where he was genuinely um, apoplectic about the uh, possibilities that Putin would win Ukraine and would continue as he has, has explicitly said to roll up uh, the rest of Europe, Lithuania, Estonia, Latvia. They believe our next. They absolutely do believe that they're next. And that's not just about our NATO allies and, and what our responsibilities are. On uh, that trip, I had the opportunity to visit our troops. And Pennsylvania, this is where I'm from, uh, has a National Guard relationship with Lithuania. That's our partner. And so our, our, our uh, servicemen and women are stationed in Lithuania within miles uh, of Belarus, miles of Belarus. And so if you think that what success looks like, what we want to also think of is, is what success doesn't look like. And what that does look like is our men and women in uniform being in harm's way and being on the front line. Last question. Um, we've t you've talked a lot about sort of the, the urgency of the need for more aid for Ukraine. What does the timeline look like for Israel, particularly in terms of, um, you know, air defense and things like that? How, how urgent is the need there? Well, I think our view from the very beginning has been, and I'm going to yield to a few of our colleagues to just close this out, but that this is a dangerous world and everything is interconnected and that it's important for us to stand with our democratic allies in Israel as it fights an existential war against Hamas, a brutal terrorist organization. And at the end of the day, the only way for there to be a just and lasting peace for both Israel and the Palestinian people is for Hamas to be decisively defeated. And so it's important for us to step in and make sure that Israel has the ability to do just that in the best interest of Israel the Palestinian people, the region, and the free world. The same is the case as it relates to our allies in the Indo-Pacific, Taiwan, Japan, and South Korea. And I'm thankful, under the leadership of President Biden, that we now see a historic alliance between South Korea and Japan. Everyone recognizes the challenges in that part of the world, and America can't abandon it. And of course, we understand the urgency uh, in Ukraine. Let me just end by uh, allowing our Marines to close us out. Uh, so I don't know, Salud, if you have any final words. <coughs> Let me just say that it is not incompatible to support Israel to make sure that they have the resources to go after a terrorist organization in Hamas. That is not incompatible with also urging them
to abide by international law to ensure that the loss of innocent civilians does not continue to occur. Those are two important goals to keep in mind. And this National Security Supplemental provides us the resources to achieve both. Thank you. Look, I think, I think Salute makes a really important point, which is that if you are the most ardent supporter of Israel or the most ardent supporter of the Palestinians, we should all want Hamas gone. The Palestinians will never be free and secure if Hamas is in charge. The Israelis will never be free and secure if Hamas is in charge. Now, from my experience fighting a counterinsurgency in Iraq, I don't think that Prime Minister Netanyahu's prosecution of this war is going too well. I think he's killing too many civilians. And ultimately, if you kill terrorists, but you kill a lot of civilians and inspires more terrorists to join the cause, then you're not winning. That's okay. We can have that disagreement, but we also have a seat at the table because we give them aid to help them learn some of the lessons, some of the mistakes that we made in Iraq and Afghanistan to get this right so that we can actually have Palestinian rights, Israeli security, and a two-state solution at the end of the day. And I think Salud makes that, that's a very important point to keep in mind. And one other thing, what this Republican dysfunction is accomplishing right now, because they're dividing America and we're not united on these fundamental issues to keep us safe and secure here at home, it's bringing Russia and China together. It's uniting Vladimir Putin and Xi Jinping. That's not good for our national security. Not now, not 10 years from now, not 20 years from now. So there's a real cost to this utter failure of Republican leadership, this complete willingness to play politics with the national security of our allies and ourselves. Jake? Along with Congressman Bolton and Congresswoman Cheryl, I'm on the House Select Committee on China. It's been a a bipartisan oasis in an otherwise partisan, unproductive Congress under the failed and dysfunctional leadership of House Republicans. And in almost every single one of the meetings and hearings that we've had in that committee where we've brought in some of the brightest experts and analysts on the Chinese Communist Party, one or another of us on that committee has asked, are they watching what's happening in Ukraine? Does Xi Jinping wake up and care? And the answer unanimously has been absolutely. He is gauging his own actions against Taiwan. He is gauging his own aggression against the United States, calibrated to the willpower that we demonstrate in Ukraine. So I say now to my Republican colleagues on the House Select Committee on China, if you are serious about standing tall and winning the 21st century against the Chinese Communist Party, join us now in bringing this supplemental to the floor for a vote so we stand tall against Russia. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.